Hey, folks. Hello, 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 hello. Hope you are well. Um, welcome to the Wednesday Word for Wednesday, January 13th. I have a few things I want to share with you today. I hope you are well. Hey, Sister Sharice, Minister Sharice. Appreciate you. It's good to see you. Um, hope you're well. And uh, in this moment, I want to talk about this moment uh, that we are in right now. Uh, like, tag, share, tell somebody. Uh, hey, Sister Darlene, uh, that Wednesday Word is starting. I want to... Uh, so much has happened since last week's Wednesday Word, uh, which occurred. The, the rioters were marching their way to the Capitol. Uh, and immediately after that, um, last week's Wednesday Word is when I stationed myself on my couch to watch the unfolding events. And... Um, Half the day I was with my mouth open like a broken pocketbook. Saying, what in the, what, who, ha, what, it? So I've had a little time to process. And so I want to share with you just for a little while uh, what I'm thinking and how I am processing all of this. Hey, Sora Wilhelmina and Minister Valerie, I see you. Thanks for joining. Um, so, you know, last, last Wednesday, I woke up Wednesday morning and learned that John Ossoff had won the Senate race. I tried to stay awake uh, through through the night to see John Ossoff, but um, I, I, I finally fell asleep around 3.30 or 4. And so when I woke up, I woke up to the pings of, I turned on the television, said my prayers, Lord, I said a quick prayer that morning. And I turned on the um, television to see what had happened. I saw that also had won, and then my phone was going off with my preacher friend. We got a little text chain. And, you know, they were uh, uh, going back and forth about the winds and so forth. And, and I was so overwhelmed with joy and pride about what we had been able to accomplish in getting the Senate back in one and it's a win for America, but it was a win for black people, uh, for black women who worked so hard, not just in this cycle, but over years, years, Stacey Abrams started her march, her idea, 12, 15 years ago, she planted the seeds and continued to water it and uh, 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 tend it until it blossomed, uh, bringing other people in, other people who worked on this, Helen Butler and Latasha Brown and Insafe, I mean, just the list goes on and on. Melanie Campbell, who all put their time, their effort, their energy, and then those of us from around the country also joined in Power Rising. Uh, which is the organization that I convened. We paid for food trucks so people standing online would be able to uh, have something to eat as they were waiting. We all did our part and we had this victory. Uh, and then I went to my train, I had a transition meeting with black women and, and the transition folks, and that was great. And out of the corner of my eyes, like, okay, where are they going? What are they doing? Now, understand. I'm in this apartment temporarily that's in Chinatown, and that's in the neighborhood where these folks stage up. Lots of little hotels there, so they're staying, so they stay there, and I see them often uh, on the weekend since Election Day, and they you walk around with the Trump t-shirts on and, you know, their flags and all that, so I've gotten used to them. So on Wednesday morning, they were making their way to the White House for what the president was going to say for that rally. And then they were making their way to the Capitol in front of it, right, you know, right in my neighborhood. And around then once they got to the Capitol and the foolishness and the shenanigans started, then there were the sirens. So the sirens were going off all day long, all day long. My nerves were so bad. By the end of the day, my nerves, my nerves were just shot 
with the sirens and, and watching what was on television and my family calling me, telling me to come home. I'm like, come home. I can't come. I'm not going over there to the Capitol by Union Station. No. And then my brother was like, I'll come get you. You're going to drive from up north down here to come get me? Okay, my brother, who if y'all know my brother, you know that was a major feat. And then I watched the destruction was incomplete. I was just flabbergasted. I've been to the Capitol many times over my career, and I've been on days when the security was nuts, like the impeachment hearings, like the confirmation of Kavanaugh, and in those, the last one was the impeachment hearings, and I went up and sat in the Senate gallery, courtesy of Senator Kamala Harris, who gave me tickets. Um, and I had to go through two metal detectors. I had to leave my purse, my Louis Vuitton purse. I had to leave it with the security officer. Now, you know separating a black woman from her purse is a problem. And separating a black woman with a Louis Vuitton bag, I finally got to the place where I could buy a Louis Vuitton bag, and you want me to leave it at the police officer station? Who gonna be watching it? I had to be clear about where my purse was. And they wouldn't even let you take things. The only thing I could take with me from my purse was my wallet. I couldn't even take an ink pen because it was a sharp metal object. This is for the impeachment hearings. And when I got to the level of where the Senate gallery was, there was another metal detector. It was nuts. So I'm watching this on Wednesday saying, how did these people even get in with their flagpoles and with the metal tips on them, with explosives, with firearms, with weaponry? How did they get in? Because the first picture that we saw were them just moseying through the rotunda and up with the flagpoles. I'm like, how'd they get the Well, who, who let them in? Then we saw the hordes and we understood that they had just run roughshod over the police officers, the Capitol Police. And of course the stories have been unfolding about the chaos, about the lack of coordination, about the ignored, uh, about the ignored uh, uh, warnings that were coming. And everybody, all these, all these law enforcement agencies are doing this. They did it, I, not me, them. Him, her, we said, we didn't know, we asked, we didn't, nuts. And yet, at the end of that, there were some things that struck me. At the end of that night, as we watched the Capitol Police call in the Metropolitan Police. Now understand, Capitol Hill is its own jurisdiction. They have their own police department and the Metropolitan Police Department, the DC Police Department, does not have any jurisdiction on Capitol Hill. You can't just, Metropolitan Police officers can't just roll up and say, we here to help. They have to be asked. They have to be invited because it is essentially its own jurisdiction. Muriel Bowser can't do nothing that happens on Capitol Hill. So now I watch that the Capitol, that the Metropolitan Police officers have been called in, and I'm like, where is the National Guard? Where there's no National Guard because Donald Trump's Defense Department would not give authorization for Muriel Bowser to activate the D.C. National Guard because D.C. is not a state. D.C. cannot a activate its own National Guard. D.C. has no governor because we are not a state, and so Muriel Bowser must have the permission of the Defense Department Trump people, specifically the Secretary of the Army Trump people, in order to get the National Guard activated. And the National Guard is not like a standard military. These are people who are on duty. You got to call them in. They got to go get their uniforms. They got to post up. They got to meet somewhere, post up before they can get on duty. So you had these Metropolitan Police officers from the District of Columbia, not a state, who were called in to protect the Capitol, who were called in to protect the electoral college process. Y'all saw them walk in in the pantry with the electoral ballots in those boxes and so that the votes could be read off. Here's the irony. 
the District of Columbia, because we're not a state, has no vote in the Electoral College. So those bastards, those boxes carrying the ceremonial votes of the Electoral College, the District of Columbia had no voice, had no paper in the box, and yet the people of the District of Columbia were called to the nation's capital to protect a process in which they had no voice and in which they had no vote. Now, how wrong is that? The irony of that, one of the things the Biden administration must do right away is grant D.C. statehood. Every other state in this union was made a state by a, by the, by a signature of a president. That's what needs to happen for the District of Columbia. Taxation without representation is tyranny. Give D.C. the vote. That's my D.C. rant. So meanwhile, now people want to blame Muriel Bowser because there wasn't any police. She can't send nobody up there. She has no jurisdiction on the Capitol. So we have insurrectionists, the rotunda, with Confederate flags, the flag of treason, the flag of overthrow, that, that Confederate flag got more, got further into the nation's capital in 2021 than it did in the 1800s. So the, the symbol of overthrow is now marching through the nation's capital. These people were standing on the scaffolding, and this is the image that sticks in my mind. Standing on the scaffolding outside of the Capitol, near the steps where Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will take their oath of office, and they were removing the American flag to replace it with, not a Confederate flag, with a Trump flag. Taking down the American flag to replace it with a Trump flag. Now in the words of my faith tradition, that is idolatry of the highest order. They're not about a person, they're not about a, a country, they about a per they're not about a country, they're not about patriotism, they are about a person. And that is Donald Trump. They have made Donald Trump their God. So this is madness. And then that night they come back for the vote and still more than a hundred members of Congress voted to overturn the election. Now understand overturning the election is yes, it's about Trump, but it's also about erasing the votes of millions of people. And in the states that they will focus on, they're erasing, they want to overturn and erase the votes of black and brown people who chose to come out and vote exercise their power and their franchise and these people want to say their votes don't count. Now I live in Texas and I want to throw out Philadelphia's votes. I live in Missouri and I want to throw out Georgia's votes because they don't agree with me because black people and brown people decided to go to the polls and votes and Lord have mercy this is what happened when they vote. Let's throw out and discard all of their votes. It's treasonous. It's a coup. And they were in there talking about kill Mike Pence. Now, I don't have no love for Mike Pence, except the love of Jesus, because I'm a good Christian, so the love of Jesus. But that's all because of the love of Jesus. I just, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Pence can go take a fly and leave. But they're in there talking about kill Mike Pence on a day when you have the sitting vice president and the incoming vice president elect. On site, you send a mob talking about kill Mike Pence. And where's Nancy Pelosi? Kill Mike Nancy Pelosi, setting up a noose on the Capitol steps. So you trying to take out the government. The number two in succession, the number one in succession, and the number two in succession. You want to remove it was a coup. Let's not get confused. It was a coup. It was a coup attempt. And we got to pay attention. And we got to be clear-eyed about this. And call, as Sister Iyana says, call a thing a thing. Call a thing a thing. So I've been mad for quite a few days. Watching this process. Retreatment. 
of what happened with the rioters and what happened with the protesters this summer, how they were treated differently. And I don't need to say what everybody has been saying. That if those had been black people on Wednesday, we would be talking about, we would still be washing the blood off the steps. But I watched these police officers gingerly treat these folks, helping them up and down the steps. Even though what we now know, they had attacked the police officers. One guy got crushed in the door. They used the police officer's own equipment to push them back, to drag them down steps, to beat them on the ground with flagpoles. And now we know that there were police officers from other jurisdictions around the country who were part of the mob, that they flashed their badges as they went in. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I hope that this is a wake-up call for those who have been too quiet. Because these people, this way of thinking, didn't just come out of nowhere. And let me be clear, this was not a creation of Donald Trump. This mindset, Donald Trump did not create it. He threw some gasoline on an already burning fire. Let's go back to the Tea Party. Let's go back to the uh, Civil Rights Movement and the Klan. Let's go back to the militias that were formed. Let's go back to slavery and, and the pockets of, 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 of rioters and uh, white supremacists that formed and that have been in existence since black people said, we will be free. This people have always been here. This sentiment has always been here. What's different now, what's different now? You have a president who was willing to fan the flames. And we technology and social media, which has allowed the pockets of the militias to find each other and to coordinate with each other. This ain't new. This ain't new. This ain't new. And the fact that there are police officers, and in my case in New York City, firefighters who were part of the insurrection, this ain't new. This is, and this is not of Donald Trump's creation. He tapped into it, fanned the flames and for his own purposes. Now, it's always been here, gonna be here. The challenge is not to make them disappear because this kind of, the devil ain't going nowhere because the devil got work to do. The question is, what do we do? What is the good, what do people of good will do in this moment? How do we respond? Now, I contend that part of the reason that this uh, mindset gets such air and has such uh, fuel is because the good people kept quiet. The good people dismissed them. The good people said, oh, they're not that serious. They crazy, they hillbillies, they poor people, they not educated, we don't need to pay them any mind. And that is what gave them air. We dismissed the seriousness of their cause, the seriousness of their intent, the seriousness, the depths of their hatred, of their supremacist attitude. And we sat back, not all, too many, sat back too many white folks just let them do what they what they was gonna do and figured oh you know oh uh, we don't need to pay this any mind now is the time for all people of goodwill and i'm talking to white folk time for you to say something because black people been saying something black people been fighting it is time for you to get off your couch of comfort and stop being complicit. And some people say, I wasn't complicit. I you were complicit by inaction. You were complicit by silence. You were complicit in helping these people grow. It's time for you to step up, stand up, and speak out. And that goes double for the people in church. White church 
and some black churches were silent in the midst of racism. Silent in the midst of sexism. We, all we wanted to do on Sunday was preach our text without teaching the people what the text meant. Without teaching the people the relevance of the text to their daily lives. Without teaching the people that Jesus was a revolutionary who came to revolutionize and revolutionize in more ways than saving your soul. That Jesus' enemy was the religious state which allowed oppression to exist among Jesus' own people. That Jesus' enemy was the empire, the Romans, who were creating the conditions in which an, a corrupt and unjust religious institutional society could flourish and exist. That's what Jesus came for. And if you're only talking about saved, sanctified, and look, I'm Pentecostal. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Bird, filled with the Holy Ghost, that was a mighty burning fire and on my way to see the soon coming king. I believe in an all night prayer. I believe in church. I stay in church all day. I love it. I love it. But part of we got we have fallen down on teaching the people the relevance of the gospel of Jesus Christ to their everyday lives and what it means in terms of their freedom and how God sees them. They ought to be free and they ought to demand freedom because God says you're free. God doesn't want you living in bondage on the earth and only getting your freedom when you get to heaven. That is not the full and abundant life that God promised us. And that is our fault. The fact that these white evangelicals can do what they're doing and say what they're saying and we don't chat. They First of all, we should have never let them rise as, and become as powerful as they are with this corrupt gospel that they're teaching. It is blasphemous. It is blasphemous what they're teaching. Where is the church to say not so we will not allow Paula White and her blasphemy in our churches? We will not listen to Franklin Graham. We will, we will not. All these so-called prophets prophesying a lie. It's on us to reclaim the gospel to reclaim the church and to come out of the shadows and for those of us who've been crying loud and sparing not, cry louder. Been silent, you need to repent. You need to repent. So, what's my next step? Where am I? I've been really mad as you can tell. Really angry about all of this. But what got lost is that the danger of white supremacy, the danger of the trauma of white supremacy, the insidiousness of this is that it comes to steal our joy. One of the side effects of supremacy, one of the side effects of this insidiousness is it keeps us in a state of trauma. It keeps us in a state of trauma where we can't breathe, where we are burdened, where we are low, where we are exhausted, where we, we just can't move. That is the trauma of white supremacy. That is its insidiousness. And we saw that this week. We couldn't even rejoice over Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff over the victory that we won because we immediately had to pivot into a state of anger and trauma over these fools storming the Capitol. And when our joy gets taken, when we are diverted from understanding our power, that then the enemy wins because we become just debilitated. We become stuck. We lose our breath. So let me tell you what I decided to do. I will, I'm going to be defiantly joyful. I am reclaiming my joy. I am going to be joyful because I know the enemy don't want that. I want to be, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to exalt in my power. I'm going to exalt in my happiness. I'm going to exalt in my joy. That's what I'm going to do. 
I will not let the enemy keep me in a state of trauma. I will not let them win by having me always angry and mad for no purpose. Now there's nothing wrong with a little anger. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. He has bent his bow and made it ready. There's nothing wrong with a little anger. But it also says be angry but sin not. I am going to be defiantly joyful. Yes, I'm going to laugh. I'm going to take care of my breath. I'm going to find space to breathe. I'm going to watch something funny on TV. I might, might watch Bridgerton for the 99th time. I'm going to find and make space for joy in my life. I'm going to pay attention to my breath. I'm going to pay attention to my breath because my breath is the rammer breath of God inside of me. I'm going to pay attention to that and make space to breathe, make time to care for myself, make time to remind myself who I am in the vision of God, who God has created me to be free, bold, proud, talented, gifted, wonderfully, fearfully made, full of God's power and purpose for such a time as this. There's no accident for why you're here today. There's no accident for why you are living in this moment. God destined that you would live in this moment, for this time, for such a time as this. What's your purpose? What you doing about it? What you doing about it? What are you doing to meet this moment? Are you educating your children? Are you educating yourself? You got your eye on what's happening? Don't be an ostrich with your head in the sand. Don't be Scarlett O'Hara. Tomorrow's another day. No, you got today. What you doing about these people? Have you called your senator? Have you called your congresswoman? Have you called your, have you called your mama? Make space for joy. Make space for your purpose. Make space to be intentional. Don't let racism steal your joy. Don't let sexism steal your power. Don't let homophobia deny who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the presence of God for such a time as this. Now, if you think this is over and that these people are done and calling, they're not. They're not. They're not. But look, the devil ain't got no new tricks been the same from the beginning where we slip up is when we're not paying attention to what the enemy is doing and having a response ready having our response ready underestimating ourselves our power our capabilities our talents our gifts let's get ready y'all suit up you think joe biden getting sworn in next week is gonna be the end oh no baby it's only the beginning suit up Get your armor ready. Be prepared for what's coming next. And in it all, in it all, baby, be defiantly joyful. Be defiantly powerful. Be defiantly happy. Be defiantly educated. Be defiantly knowledgeable. Be defiantly active. This is the will of God concerning you. I love you. I'm praying for you. Make space for joy. Make space for breath. Be intentional about it. Step away. Take 10 minutes to breathe. Look at the ceiling. Take a nap. Do what you got to do to hold on to your joy, to hold on to your breath. Reclaim your joy. I'm excited about Raphael Warner. I'm excited about John Arsene. I'm excited about what's coming. I'm excited about this inauguration. I'm excited about Kamala Harris. I love Joe, but I'm excited about Kamala Harris. I'm excited for what the next steps are. I'm excited for the new awakening that I believe is happening across the country as we deal with this enemy that is in our presence. God bless you. Today is my daddy's birthday. He turned 90 today. If you know him, even if you don't know him, go on his Facebook page, leave him a message, leave him a birthday post. He does read his Facebook pages. Yes, he does. So go on his Reverend Herbert Daughtry, his Facebook page, leave him a note. Uh, tell him happy birthday. He's 90. He is my heart. I love him uh, to the moon and back. And so happy birthday, Daddy. I love you. God bless you all.